Presbyterian Church. When you came in the sanctuary, I hope you received a bulletin with uh, some announcements. I want to call your attention to a few announcements, but also just mention that we'd love to have a record of your presence. There's these little registration pads that are found in the racks there or maybe the seat next to you. And I would love to have uh, everyone fill this out, members as well as guests, but there's a little card in there for prayer requests if you have a specific prayer request that you'd like the pastors to be praying along with you about. Or if you have questions about what it means to be a member of First Presbyterian Church, what does it mean to be a Christian, or how can you grow more in your faith? We'd love to help you and come alongside you in any way there. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of announcements. There's some specific announcements uh, for parents about children's check-in, check-in system and barcodes. Also some activities here as the summer is winding down. And I'm sorry, kids, yes, school is... Uh, in, uh, the, in the front of us uh, not uh, too many days uh, from now. We had a great time at our uh, adult gathering talking about education and fulfilling our calling. Tonight we have prayer, uh, praying for missionaries. If you heard, the drinkers, Carrie and Chris, have landed in the Philippines. And I say settled, it was three days before the tsunami hit. And that's not Daniel Drinker, that was actually a storm and uh, knocked the power out and they're okay. And, uh, but uh, you can come pray for the drinkers tonight as well as our other missionaries at 515. And then uh, be in prayer for our pastor, uh, George and Jackie are in Haiti along with our youth pastor and Mike Phillips, a number of our uh, staff are there, they'll be coming back tomorrow. And um, then also note there's an announcement about men our uh, manhood seminar, uh, Authentic Manhood, we're going to be talking more about how to live shoulder to shoulder and how to raise young men, godly men. Uh, uh, that's August the 15th. We're going to have a dinner. It's a Friday night. Put that on your calendar. You'll be hearing more about, hearing more about that as well. Now let's prepare our hearts uh, as we listen to the meditation and prepare our hearts for worship.
Lord's Day. Would you stand now as we respond to His call to worship? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Though we have not seen Him, we love Him. And even though we do not see Him now, we believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. The Lord be with you. Let's worship this great God. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. 
So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. The grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of our God stands forever. This text is one of those powerful gospel texts in the Old Testament. And we've learned here in this church many times that as John Calvin said, this text almost makes a mockery of God's justice and His judgment because it so highlights His mercy and grace. And this is a text I made my children learn, memorize early on, uh, one of the ones I wanted them to know, the character of the covenant-keeping God who is abounding in mercy and steadfastness. He's a faithful, covenant-keeping God. And even though we know from Scripture that God has placed His covenant love on us and He's faithful to His covenant promises, we can tend to doubt. And so God in His mercy has given us covenant signs so that we can tell our weak consciences to stand in faith because God is true to His Word. Just as in a wedding, you're given the ring as a, as a sign of the covenant. So God has given to the Purple family this morning the sign of covenant baptism to remind them of God's faithfulness that extends through generations, through Abraham, through Isaac, all the way down to their very children, to their daughter this morning. So with great confidence in God's proclamation of His faithfulness and justice to us, we receive the sign of baptism this morning. I'll ask the Propal family to come up now along with their elder, Jim Bowden. And hear now these vows for you. Parents, do you believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? And do you confess Jesus Christ, God's Son, to be your Lord and Savior? Do you? Do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you acknowledge that although our children are conceived and born sinners and therefore subject to the miseries of the fall, yet Christ calls them holy? because of their relation to you as members of His church? Do you believe God's covenant promise to be your God and the God of your children, and thus present your child for holy baptism as the sign and seal of her reception into the covenant family of God? Do you? Do you promise, with the help of God, to bring your daughter up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to pray with her and with her, and to make every effort so to order your own lives that you will not cause this little one to stumble, do you? Do you promise to encourage her as soon as she's able to understand the significance of her baptism and to confess her own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and become an active member of her church serving faithfully in her fellowship, do you? Do you claim God's covenant promises on her behalf and look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation even as you do for your own, do you? And finally, do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in a humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you will pray with her and for her and teach her the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do you? Great. Elder Bone, would you pray for these parents to be faithful to their vows? Lord, we thank you for today, for David and Mary Beth, desire to bring those of into a covenant relationship with you. We pray that the blessing, your blessing on this family as you walk with them, and that Elizabeth Lane will never know a day when she did not know you as her Savior. We ask this in thy name. Amen. Beautiful. We have one more vow. This is for you as a congregation.
You as a congregation promise to assist these families as they bring up their daughter in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Meaning, will you support them by praying for them and with them and by living out your own need for the gospel here in this church and teaching in the Sunday school and nursery when able. Whatever you can do to assist these parents in their vows today. If you can say you will, would you say amen? Amen. amen. What name is given this child? Elizabeth Lane for Paul, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, it's hard to imagine that you view us this way. Such love and tenderness that you have shown toward us as your children. And we thank you that this little lamb belongs to you. And we do pray, Father, that all her life she would follow and love the Lord Jesus. That she would always understand her need of a Savior and cling to the cross of Christ. That she would follow closely after you and take up her cross to follow you. And that, Father, you would bless her with a long, rich life of joy in the Lord. We pray for these parents to have the grace they need to bring these children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and for this congregation to assist them. We pray all this for the glory of Christ and the sake of this little one. In Jesus' name, amen.
for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to my life and make it holy thine. Fill all my heart with thy great love divine. Take all my will, my passion self and pride. Our gracious God, thank you for testifying to our weak hearts again, that we belong to you. Those who are here who know Christ as Savior have nothing to fear, nothing to hide. They are embraced. We are embraced as your beloved sons and daughters. So with that in mind, we come to the throne of grace now to intercede on behalf of our family here. We pray, O oh Father, for those who are battling sickness or are in the hospital. We remember Rod Vesey today and with thanksgiving for this one who has ministered faithfully in this church and community for many years. We ask your healing touch for him. Father, he's had many difficulties this year. Please be near to he and his family. We pray, Father, too, for Patty Lillis's sister, Penny, who has gone on, undergone surgery for many health issues. We ask for her healing and for wisdom for the physicians. We think today for Patty Etterly and the loss of her mother and ask your comfort and nearness to her. For those who are battling ongoing illness, Father, for those who are serving our country in harm's way, we ask your blessing and protection, your nearness to them. Father, we think of our ministry and focus today, Medical Campus Outreach. And with Thanksgiving, we thank you for the many who've come through our own medical community and others and have been discipled in Christ to grow and use their gifts for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray your blessing on this ministry, that, that there would be rich discipleship, that many would come to know Christ as Savior and Lord. We pray for the expansion work that they want to see in Athens and Orlando and Columbia and ask that you would establish the work of their hands and bless these, these campus outreach, medical campus outreach ministries as well. We pray, Father, for our youth and other adults who are in Haiti and return tomorrow for our Pastor George Robertson and Pastor Caleb Click and Pastor Mike Phillips and uh, others who are there and the students, Father. We pray that you would bring them home safely that you would do a mighty work of grace in their hearts as you expose them to the needs of the world and the call of the gospel. Bless their efforts, Father, and use this trip for not only the Haitians, but for our students as well. Father, we thank you that you have called us up to be generous givers, and we pray that you would cause us to be more and more generous in our giving so that the advancement of the gospel would not be hindered, so that the ministries of this church would continue to flourish we praise you for your blessing upon us, and we ask that you would make us ever more faithful servants 
for your glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated, and please pass that friendship pad now, so we can know your presence. God's placed us in a family to remind one another that He is a merciful God that is the vision that brings us peace. Uh, let's greet one another in that peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all and also with you. Stand and greet one another.
please be seated and turn to our New Testament lesson, which is Matthew chapter 20. If you need a Bible this morning, you can find this on page 1029 in the Pew Bible there in front of you. If you're new to us, we've been preaching through many of the parables of Jesus this summer as our pastor has several uh, weeks away from preaching, at least the evenings and a few Sunday mornings. So this is our series. We've covered many of the parables and this morning we have a new one in Matthew chapter 20, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. A couple weeks ago I was, I decided to run from my house to the YMCA, and it's not that it's such a long run or even that difficult. It's just one of those mornings where it was very hot and I felt terrible. My intention was to to run up there and lift some weights and then run back, and I barely made it up there. I felt like I stumbled in the door and walked by to get a towel from the guy, and I was going to lift some weights, and uh, I did that and took a towel and went over, and I just felt so worn out that I I think I did a few sets of bench press or something, and... uh, said, this is it, this day's over, and I turned around and brought the towel and threw it in the trash can there to to keep them in, and and, uh, the guy said to me behind the counter there, he said, "Uh, great workout, (laughs) and I I didn't, I didn't know what that, was that, was he complimenting, because I mean, I was drenched in sweat, maybe he's complimenting me, maybe he's mocking me, maybe, uh, maybe he's not even talking to me, right, I, I didn't know, how do I understand that? How do I translate that? And honestly, it sat with me for at least two weeks now. And, and every time I, I go to the Y, I want to make sure that guy really sees me you know, working in case he was mocking me. I, I say that because that's very similar to the power of the parables. When, when the people would hear the parables of Jesus, these stories, they, they would go, is he being funny? Is he being sarcastic? What points is he trying to make? Is he talking to me? Maybe he's talking about somebody else. What am I supposed to do with this story that he just told? And it would sit with them for a long time. Those who had ears to hear would hear. They would understand the message. Those who did not have ears to hear, eyes to see, would not understand the message. Let's pray now that the Lord would give us eyes and ears to see what he has for us. Reading now at Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and about the ninth hour and did the same. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. The eleventh hour, by the way, one hour till quitting time, five o'clock. So about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those who were hired first came, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us and have, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of God. Thanks be to you, O God. Let's pray together. O Father, would you give us eyes to see and hearts to respond 
to the truth of your word that you have for us today. Dispatch your spirit, we pray, to be our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In high school, I worked for my uncle who had several, uh, he had a commercial real estate business and, and I was just a, a gopher and yard worker. And in fact, I was in Greenville not long ago and took my children by a fence that I spent a summer painted and it looked terrible, but I said this was a walk down nostalgia, memory lane, and there's a fence that daddy painted in the summer. And uh, I had this crew leader guy who was, who was definitely rough around the edges and I learned all sorts of stuff I wish I hadn't learned that summer. And he uh, would take me to spots and he would leave me for hours on end and say, you get started here, I've got to run, do such and such, and then I'll come back and get you. And I would be left out in the hot sun painting this fence for hours. And I never understood where he went or what he did, but he always acted like he had somewhere to be. One day I noticed when he came back that there was lipstick and makeup on his collar. And I didn't know a lot then, but I knew that didn't seem right. And so I just remember feeling the feeling of there's something that's not right about this work relationship and arrangement we have here. This guy's getting paid more than me. I feel like I'm the only one working. And I tell you what, there's something, isn't it? When you feel like you're working for an unjust boss or you feel like you're working and being taken advantage of you, something happens that makes you angry. These workers in the field, not rightfully, but certainly felt that something wasn't right about this work relationship than they had. Jesus here is making a point to us, just as he was making a point to his disciples here as he tells this story. Now, to under, really understand this, you have to understand the context, of course. So you have to flip back to chapter 19, which is right here before. Some of you, it's on the same page. And here's what's going on. It says in that chapter that, that Jesus began to turn his focus towards his disciples. So he's no longer speaking just to the masses. He is driving in this focus on his disciples. Own, the ones who have chosen to follow him. That's a disciple of Christ. And Jesus had just encountered the rich young ruler, the one who Jesus said, you've done well, but you've got to sell all, give up all of your earthly possessions and follow me. Why did Jesus do it? Because he knew that that rich young ruler was not ready to follow him. So Peter, you know Peter, prideful, Impetuous Peter stands up and goes, well, Lord, <laughs> we're not like that rich young ruler. What's in it for us? What about those of us who have left everything? Remember, they dropped their nets and they followed him. Lord, what's in it for us, Peter said. Those who have followed you, what are you going to do for us? Well, this is the context of this parable. Jesus doesn't just rebuke Peter in that moment. In that moment, he actually tells Peter, hey, you're actually going to reign with me in the future kingdom and you're going to be rewarded for your service to me in the future kingdom. But Peter, I want to tell you a story. Because Peter, what you are saying is that you have this sense of entitlement. This sense that I am somehow your debtor, Peter, because you've left all to follow me, that I must owe you something. This quid pro quo arrangement where you do something for me, so now I, in response, must do something for you. And Jesus is going to point out to Peter here and to all of us that he doesn't owe us anything. That it is all because of his mercy. He is not our debtor. In fact, we are his debtors for being allowed to even be in his kingdom. So he goes on to tell this story of the workers in the vineyard. Peter says, as we would often say, wouldn't it, God, I've done all this for you, now what's in it for me? That question, what's in it for me, frames the context from chapter 19. This is the same attitude, isn't it, of the elder brother and the prodigal son. A parable we won't study this summer, but uh, one that is, is full of this idea that this, this elder brother stayed at home with the father he followed him all his days, did what the father asked him. And so now the elder brother says, what's in it for me, father? You gave all of this inheritance to my younger brother who squandered everything in riotous living. 
I've stayed home with you, Father. I've been the good son. So what's in it for me? Maybe you feel that way too. All these years, God, I've served you. What are you going to do for me now? Lord, I don't deserve to be treated the way I've been treated by whoever. I've I've been faithful to you, God. I don't deserve to be treated like this. Lord, I've been faithful to you. I've walked with you all my life. You owe me a child, even if I'm barren. Lord, when are you going to give me what's, what's mine? Lord, I've been faithful in my job. I've done it with integrity and equity and, and, and justice. And that person over there who, who uh, lives a, a very immoral life and steps on other people and is dishonest in business, this person seems to advance and yet I don't advance. Lord, when are you going to give me what's mine? I've done all this for you. What are you going to do for me? That's the attitude Peter shows here. It's an arrogant attitude one of entitlement. Lord, I have all these trials, all these sicknesses, all these burdens that these people out here don't seem to have. And yet I've been the one that's walked with you faith. I've done my part. When are you going to do your part? I think this is very applicable to the church, the evangelical church in our country for sure. In a world in which we find ourselves being more and more persecuted for standing for righteousness. In a world in which we're going to face more and more ostracism and hatred because of the cross of Jesus, somewhere along the line, didn't we, we felt like as the American church that we were owed protection. We were owed safe passage. We were owed our freedom. And yet Jesus says, the one thing I can promise you is You're going to take up your cross and you're going to follow me to death. You're going to be persecuted as I was persecuted. In this world, you will face trouble. And yet we sense and get angry sometimes as if we're entitled to the freedoms of religion that we have. And yet, God doesn't owe us anything. God, how can you do this to me? I followed you so faithfully. God, when are you going to give me what I deserve? Not knowing that if he really gave us what we deserve, it would be hell. Yet this is the arrogant and hypocritical pattern of Peter. And honestly, friends, this is my heart too. But Jesus wants to make this point, and if you want to go to sleep after this, just hear this and you'll be okay. That the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is not about merit, it's about mercy. That from beginning to end, it's not about what you've done to deserve it or how much you've served him, that he should owe you something. Everything is about mercy. Everything is about grace. You get into the kingdom because of mercy. You serve in the kingdom because of mercy. You will be rewarded one day because of mercy. Not because you deserve anything. Not because I deserve anything. It's about mercy from beginning to end. It's about God's mercy and our unworthiness to receive His mercy. Well, I framed this this morning in terms of the questions of the text that are here. And I think that the the questions help us work our way through it. But this next question that appears in the text highlights this idea of the constitution of the kingdom. The very nature of, what does this kingdom look like? And you hear it here in this question that is asked, Jesus, or the foreman rather, asked, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? The idea is, just what is answered here, we've been standing here all day because no one has hired us. It's it's meant to make the point that all of these workers that are going to be in this vineyard are only in the vineyard because someone showed mercy to go and get them. It's much like what used to happen, if it doesn't happen still, right down here on uh, next to the Salvation Army, where day laborers, would, would men who did construction or, or whatever, would come and they would pull up in their trucks and there would be all these men standing out here who wanted to work. And the person would pick people to work and they'd hop in the back of the truck and they'd go work for the day and they would bring them back down town. You didn't get on the truck unless you were picked. It was all of mercy. The nature of the kingdom of God is one of mercy. This question answers this idea. Why are you standing here doing nothing all day? Because we're merciless. We're dependent completely on your mercy for us. 
There's an inclusio that happens at the end of chapter 19 and at the end of this parable. And it's this phrase. The first will be last and the last will be first. And then at the end it says, the last will be first and the first will be last. It's switched, but it's meant to be a bookend to highlight the essential nature of what this parable is about, which is this. The kingdom of heaven is given to those who don't deserve it, not to those who think they do deserve it. The kingdom is about mercy from beginning to end. This is, this is human logic flipped on its head. It, it, it seems to be. It's that Jesus is saying those who think they deserve it will not get in the kingdom, but those who know they don't deserve it will get in the kingdom. So Jesus tells the story. The first hour of the, the early in the morning, he says, 6 a.m. in the morning, the, the worker goes out and he hires uh, people. And he says, I will pay you a denarius to come and work for me. And thrilled to have a job because of this, this landowner's mercy. They hop in the truck and they drive off to the vineyard. 9 a.m., the third hour, he goes back to that same spot and he says, get in my truck, I'll take you to work. And I'll pay you whatever is right, he says this time. And then at noon, which is the sixth hour, he does the same thing. And then at 3 p.m., which is the ninth hour, he does the same thing. And then at 5 p.m., the 11th hour, one hour before quitting time, the truck pulls up again. And he says, why have you been standing here all day? Get in the truck and come work with me in my vineyard. And then amazingly, he pays them at the end of the day in reverse order because he wants those who were hired first to see what he does with those who were hired last. He's making the point. He doesn't want us to miss it. So those that were hired first would assume they would get their payment first. They've been here the longest. Pay us so we can go home. But he starts with the 11th hour workers. They've been on the job one hour and he gives them a denarius. And then he gives all the rest of them a denarius, all the way down to those people who had been there at 6 a.m. in the morning, in the heat of the day, working all day long, and they get the same payment. And the grumbling starts. They grumble because I think they have the same two problems you and I have. One is a sense of entitlement and envy. Entitlement and envy. They think, landowner, you've dealt us a bad hand. We worked so hard all day long for you and all you gave us was the same that these people got. We deserve better than this. We don't deserve to be treated like this. We deserve something else. And then the problem of envy. We don't like what you did for them. We don't like how you're treating them in comparison to how you're treating us. Why am I working out here all day in the hot of the day and they get the same thing that I get. You know, Ro uh, Theodore Roosevelt said that comparison is the thief of joy. It's true, isn't it? Comparison robs us of our joy. It's a dangerous game. And notice how we always compare ourselves with those to whom we think have better or more than us. Which makes us grumble and complain. If we would compare ourselves to those who in society have less than us, it would turn our our comparison into gratitude, right? Into joy. We don't compare with those whom uh, we think have less than us. We only compare with those that we perceive have more or are treated better than us. Entitlement and envy. I deserve better. And why are you treating these people so well? Well, this last heading here, the character of the king, is illustrated in the last questions that are asked in this text. I'll set it up this way. In the first service, I, I, I told the story about one of my children, so uh, since they're in this service, it's, it's somebody else's family, okay? But this other guy I know, <laughs> he had a daughter, and they were on vacation. And the daughter went to the refrigerator in the middle of the day and, and took something she wasn't supposed to get. I don't know if it was, I don't remember if it was ice cream or what, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon, and I happened to just walk in, and, and how God always allows us to catch you know, our kids right in the act. And, and I walked in and, and I said, sweetheart, or this other guy said, sweetheart, did, <laughs> did you ask mommy for that? And, and, and the one child sort of started to him and haw a little bit, started to be a little deceptive. And, and 
I just stopped her and I said, I want you to know, you don't believe Daddy loves you, do you? And she said, of course I believe Daddy loves me. That's ridiculous. And I said, no, you don't believe Daddy loves you. And let me tell you why you don't believe I love you. Because you think that I'm not going to give you what I want, what you want. Or you think that I'm going to withhold something from you, not because I love you, but, uh, but because I'm mean or I don't care for you. You don't believe I have your best interest in mind. Now, she had no idea what I said there. <laughs> but I, it's just one of those things that you actually tell somebody else and then you, you think, huh, that's how I treat the Lord. You see, when we grumble against the Lord with our sense of entitlement or our envy of others, when we grumble against the Lord, we're doubting His character. Peter's question, Lord, what's in it for us? What are you going to do for us? Is questioning the character of Jesus. And so these last three questions here answer the question of God's character. And what I want you to know is that whatever your lot in life, God is true to his character. And the three questions are these. The first one, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? In other words, am I not just and right and fair? Have I, have I lied to you in some way? Did I not keep my word? And the obvious answer is yes, you did keep your word. You promised a denarius and you gave a denarius. You see, the point is, as we doubt and grumble against the character of God, we're forgetting that God is trustworthy and fair and right and good in all of his ways. He never mistreats us. Hear that. God never mistreats you. He always does what is right. It's a, it's a curious question. It says in the text that after he asked this question that they, verse 10, expected to receive more. Why would they expect to receive more? He had told them what they were going to get. And he was true to his word. Have you ever felt that way? God, you've shortchanged me here on this one. You, you have not given me what you, you owe me here, God. You have not been true to to what you said you would do. And yet, Abraham says, shall not the God of all the earth, the judge of all the earth, do right? And the implied answer is yes. He will always do what is right and just. And when we get to heaven, Revelation 15 says that this will be the song that we sing. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. God is always just and right and honest and true to his word. He always acts with integrity. He always keeps his promise. Second question that comes here at the end about the character of God is this. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? What's he saying there? Jesus is saying, I'm sovereign. This is my vineyard. This is my field. This is, these, these, are, you know, these are my vines. I can do what I want with my things. I'm God. I get to make the decisions. Don't I have the right to do with my money what I want to do? And the answer is yes. God decides who enters the kingdom. God decides when they enter the kingdom. The kingdom. God decides what roles happen in the kingdom. God decides, God decides, God decides because God is the sovereign, eternal, everlasting creator of the ends of the earth, the all powerful, all knowing one. There is no other like our God. Salvation from beginning to end is about God and His mercy. Don't I have a right to do with my money what I want to do? The answer is yes. This is tough sometimes, isn't it? We go to Romans 9 and you, you read, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. I've chosen one and not the other. And so we go, whoa, whoa, whoa that's, not, that's not right. That is not right. But the text goes on to say, who are we, the clay, to tell the potter how he can form and fashion and what he can do with the clay? When's the last time you've heard clay talk? Clay doesn't talk. The potter gets to decide because he's sovereign. Peter, in John chapter 21, as Jesus is describing what kind of death Peter will die, Peter says, 
Okay, but what about John? What about him? What's going to happen to him? How will he die? And Jesus says, what is that to you, Peter? You follow me. Jesus, again, expressing his complete dominance and control and power. I am the sovereign God of the universe. Jonah hated God because of the mercy he showed to the Ninevites. Think about, think about the thief on the cross. I mean, that, that sucker, he got to live his whole life doing whatever he wanted to do. And then he's hanging on the cross by Jesus. And Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. I mean, it's, who gets to decide that? God does. God does. We want to be the judge and jury. We want to fashion a God in our own image that thinks and acts the way we do. But that would not be God. He's sovereign over all things. You know, those workers in the vineyard, they could stomach the fact that, that maybe the person who was hired in the third hour or the sixth hour got the same as them. But what they cannot, just cannot tolerate is that the people who worked one hour before closing time got the same amount as them. They want God to do what God, they want God to do what they want Him to do, to act in the way they see best. I want to ask you this question this morning. Who are your 11th hour people? You know, who are the ones that you want to tell God, not, not them? God, I've been following you all these years, but, but not them. Not those ones who practice those socially abominable sins. Not the one who's treated me this way. Not those ones who society itself looks down on. Lord, uh, don't show grace to them. Not the abusers. Not the deviant sinners. Not, who are your 11th hour people this morning? If you have 11th hour people, which I do, then I'm just like the elder brother. Lord, I did all these things for you. And you're going to show that kind of love to that one? Which leads to the last question, then, that shows us the character of God. Are you envious because I am generous? Are you envious because I'm generous? In other words, God is generous, reckless, lavish in His mercy and grace to undeserving sinners. You see, you and I don't deserve anything. We can't resent how God treats other people when we understand that it's all of grace, our story included. There's not one of you this morning who has deserved anything from God, that God is your debtor. But the Lord wants to show us that He's just and right in all His ways, and He's sovereign over all His creation, and He is extravagant in His mercy. You see, if we have the sense of entitlement, if we have a sense of envy this morning, then we've forgotten that we were desperate too. We've forgotten that we were on the side of the road, that the truck came by and we wouldn't have work to be in the part of the kingdom. We wouldn't be in the vineyard if that truck hadn't put us in the truck. But God is rich in mercy, generous in grace. The landowner here is concerned not for his vineyard. He's concerned for the workers. I mean, think about it. What is the five o'clock worker even going to do when he gets there? By the time he gets in the truck and gets out to the vineyard and he, and he puts on his work boots and he goes out to the vineyard and he gets his pruning shears or whatever they do and, and he gets out in the middle of the vineyard, by the time he gets out there, it's going to be time to, what could he possibly do for the landowner? He can't contribute anything. That's not the point. The point is to highlight the lavish mercy of God. Tim Keller in his book, Prodigal God, has been uh, so helpful to the church in this way. But to describe the story of the prodigal son, not as the story of the prodigal son, but as the story of the prodigal father. Prodigal means reckless, lavish, extravagant. What the father did in the prodigal son was reckless. It was extravagant. He was just showering mercy on one who didn't deserve it. What the landowner does in this parable is extravagant and reckless. You see, this parable is beautiful if you understand that we are all 11th hour workers. Our problem is we think we're first hour workers, that somehow we've earned something from God, that he owes us something, this sense of entitlement. And we're envious and jealous of how he treats others because we've forgotten we were on the side of the road and need to get in the work truck. 
We are the 11th hour workers. God has called us to not have the attitude of the first who will be made last, but to have the attitude of the last who know they don't deserve anything. And that act of desperate dependence on the Father makes you the first to receive His grace and His mercy and to lavish His prodigal love on you. This is good news for us because we're all 11th hour workers. This is good news for you parents who have wayward children because God is an 11th hour worker God. You might remember the televangelist Jim Baker, Jim and Tammy Fay, who had the PTL, Praise the Lord Ministry and Club up in Charlotte. They built that multi-million dollar empire mostly by frauding people of their seed faith gifts. Uh, this idea that you give something and God will bless it, so give it to me. It's an abomination. It's heresy. It's evil. The man took advantage of thousands and thousands and thousands of, of our grandparents, right, who, who gave to this, this kind of thing. He was found to be a fraud. He, had, he committed adultery with his secretary and Jim Baker, Lost everything. Thrown into prison. Rightfully so. He had broken the law in multiple ways. But there's a great story of the day when, not long after he had been in prison, Billy Graham showed up at the prison to visit him. Now think about that. Billy Graham, the one who had faithfully served Christ, not for his own well-being, but for the glory of Christ and the advancement of the church and the cause of the gospel... And this one who had made a mockery of the church, a mockery of the gospel, a mockery of our Savior. So when Billy Graham showed up at the prison, they called for Jim Baker who was cleaning. And he came out looking all disheveled and dirty and smelling. And he saw Billy Graham and he said, who are you here to see? Knowing that Billy Graham wouldn't be there to see him. How could he be? And yet he said, I'm here to see you and I want you to know that as you have repented God has forgiven you, and I want you to know that I forgive you too, and I love you. And he embraced him. He hugged him right there. After Jim Baker got out of prison, he had no place to go, no wife, no family, no anything. So he went and stayed with the Graham family. They invited him in to stay in their home. And they took him to church, and he sat by Ruth Graham in worship. Unbelievable grace. Lavish, extravagant grace and mercy to one who didn't deserve. Let me ask you this question. Do you think that Jim Baker, and I don't know where he is today, but do you think Jim Baker, sitting in church by Ruth Graham, after all the love they showed him, do you think that Jim Baker had any resentment for how God might show mercy and grace to others? Do you think he felt any sense of entitlement? you think he went, <laughs> I, I deserve, I'm sitting by Ruth Graham, I deserve to be here. It's about time people noticed who, no, this guy knew who he was and what he had done. How could he possibly resent others for God's grace and mercy? You see, we're all 11th hour workers. And when you understand that you don't belong except for the mercy of God, then you do belong. And you get to understand the riches of our, of our generous God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that the first will be last and the last will be first. And I pray that we would understand our last placeness as 11th hour workers and cry out for the mercy and grace of a loving, generous, merciful Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
receive the Lord's blessing. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing His will. And may He work in us what is pleasing to Him, now and forevermore. Amen.